Thanks so much, Dr. Sand. Hi. Um, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Monaco. So hello, everyone, and welcome. I am excited to present today's topic about mindfulness for chronic pain. So before I dive into uh, today's presentation, here is a little bit about me. My name is Sam. Uh, I'm a clinical pain psychology fellow at Stanford Medicine. I recently completed my doctoral training in clinical psychology at University of Detroit Mercy, an internship at VA Boston. And my research training was in the University of Michigan, focusing on psychosocial factors that can predict better pain management. In my spare time, I love dancing, doing yoga, and spending time with my family and pet. Here I have a picture of her. Her name is Coco, and she's about nine years old. All right, so here is what we are going to discuss today. First, we are going to discuss about what is mindfulness? Where did it come from? And we will also briefly talk about how it evolved into a modern mind-body practice. Then we will also going to discuss why should we care about mindfulness? How can it benefit uh, people with a chronic pain. In addition, we will also talk about, does it, it really work? What is the scientific evidence? Finally, we will discuss how can we practice mindfulness? How can we apply to chronic pain? All right, so what is mindfulness? Some of you may already heard of it. So currently, the most widely agreed definition of mindfulness is the state where we are paying attention in particular way on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. Mindfulness is the basic human ability to be fully present aware of where we are, what we are doing, and not overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. Mindfulness is a quality that every human being already possesses. It's not something that you have to create. We just have to learn how to access what is already inside all of us. So where did mindfulness come from? So the term mindfulness came from Buddhist philosophy more than 2,500 years ago. Mindfulness originally came from Buddhist concept of sati, which relates to the moment to moment awareness of present events. While mindfulness was widely practiced in the East for a long time, it did not make it its way over to the United States until the 1970s. It was introduced by Zan Kabat-Zinn to promote mind-body approach to cope with stress and illness to, and uh, improve overall well-being. So one thing I want to emphasize here is that you do not need to belong to or follow the religious belief or spirituality to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness provides a lot of health benefits and you can access them without following religious belief or spirituality. And that is what I'm going to focus today. So now we clear that up, let's go a little bit deeper in what mindfulness is. So have you ever noticed when your body is one place, but your mind is somewhere else? Yeah, I'm sure all of us have that experience at some point in our lives. And mindfulness is actually the way that our body and mind can be in the same place. So let's think of this way. How do we feel when we dwell on the past 
or things we lost, we might feel sad, angry, and disappointed, which makes it very difficult to appreciate what we have. What about when we are preoccupied with the future? We might feel scared, worried, anxious, and that might make us feel very difficult to focus on what we have to do or what we have to focus. And have you noticed the times you were totally engaging in an event or activity and did not even notice pain in the body and mind? And ultimately, mindfulness is to kind of a way to help us bring our mind and body back to the present moment. And there is a saying that kind of captures what I just talked about. Um, it, it says like this, yesterday is history, tomorrow is mystery, and today is a gift. When we are truly in the present moment, here and now, it can free ourselves from automatic and un unhelpful way of thinking and responding. So mindfulness is being, not doing, and mindfulness is the skill where we can observe, describe, and be aware of what's going on in us, around us, without judging or reacting. It is an acceptance, letting go of things that are not in our control, trust ourselves, and be compassionate towards ourselves and others. And mindfulness is not a religion. Mindfulness is not a relaxation strategy. Relaxation is a byproduct of mindfulness, but it's not a main goal of it. And mindfulness is not a technique. Mindfulness is not always the same as meditation. It's not equate to meditation. So to summarize, Mindfulness is a way of living. So let's keep this in mind as we go forward with this lecture. So recently, mindfulness is becoming more popular as an accessible option for improving overall well-being. And as the conversation around health continues to evolve, so does the conversation around mindfulness. So then you might be wondering, why is mindfulness becoming more popular? So that might be because there are a growing body of research suggesting that mindfulness has been found to improve mental health and physical health. So for mental health side of things, it can reduce stress, reduce anxiety, improve mood and happiness, increase the ability to concentrate and focus, and improve self-esteem. Additionally, it can increase our everyday energy, improve sleep, improve heart functioning, it helps with digestive problems, and it has also been suggested to enhance pain management. So more specifically, research suggested that mindfulness can help with various types of chronic pain, such as chronic backpack, uh, back pain and fibromyalgia, headaches and migraines, chronic pelvic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, and so on. Here, I am not suggesting mindfulness to replace your current pain treatments at all. Instead, think of mindfulness as you can add another tool in your toolbox. So, so you can use different tools for different situations. So when you are wondering, um, so then you might be wondering, how can mindfulness work for chronic pain, right? So I like to share one of the uh, Buddha stories with you. So story goes like this. 
Buddha once asked us students, if a person is struck by an arrow, is that painful? And student replied, of course it is. And Buddha then asked, if the person is struck by a second arrow, is that even more painful? And student replies, yeah, it is. And Buddha then explained, in life, we cannot always control the first arrow. However, the second arrow is our reaction to the first arrow. With the second arrow comes the possibility of the choice. So the Buddha compares being afflicted with bodily pain to the being struck by the first arrow. Adding mental pain to physical pain is like being hit by second arrow. So secondary pain is still real pain. It is a byproduct of natural human reaction to analyze the situation so you can avoid pain in the future. But over time, doing so can amplify the pain experience as you dwell on distressing thoughts. So mindfulness, being able to fully present in the here and now without judging or reacting can give you a break from this cycle, allowing you to get off the thought train, even if briefly to soothe or even rewire yourself in a way that turns down the volume of your pain. And mindfulness gives us the possibility to choose how to respond to pain. So this, this might sound a little too abstract. So I'd like to discuss a little bit more by illustrating how the cycle of chronic pain can be maintained or changed in the next slide. So have you noticed that your pain gets worse when you are stressed and worried about pain? Some of you might be able to recall an experience or two. Um, if we follow this diagram together, generally when we experience painful sensation, we can we can think of it as like, oh, danger, something must be uh, wrong. It might be something might be damaged and making us really worried about it. When that happens, our brain becomes very focused on pain, then sends a message to our nervous system to respond as if we are in fight, flight, or freeze state. When we are in fight, flight, or freeze state, what happened to our body, our muscle? Our muscle get very tensed and our body get very stiff which results in probably more pain and more pain leads to more worries about pain and activate our nervous system to tighten up muscle and body more, resulting in even more pain. So the vicious cycle of pain continues. Then when we experience pain, what if we practice mindfulness? So we can practice mindfulness to create that mental space between pain and our reaction. By that, we can feel less anxious, our muscle can be more relaxed, and we can engage in more activities that we usually enjoy. And this can help us feel more in control despite pain. Um, and that can lead to greater sense of well being. In other words, by changing how we relate to pain, we can change the cycle differently. The key to remember, the key thing to remember here is that how we relate to our pain can have a very direct impact on how much pain we live with and are able to tolerate. So I'd like to share um, Viktor Frankl's quote to capture what we just talked about. He was an Austrian psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor. Some of you uh, may have heard of him. He said this, between stimulus and response, there is a space. So here the stimulus can be pain, right? So between pain and response, there is a space. 
in this space is our power to control our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Just like that, instead of autopilot mode to react to pain, mindfulness can create the space between pain and our reaction. Through this space, we can modify pain experience. So then now the question is, are these scientifically supported? So next, I'd like to discuss some of the scientific evidence. So there is a substantial body of research suggesting that people with a higher mindfulness in general experience lower pain, greater pain tolerance, increased mobility, less fear and rumination about pain, better mood, better sleep, and higher overall life satisfaction. And clinical trial um, study also demonstrated evidence suggesting that mindfulness practice can provide these benefits. So mindfulness has been utilized in different psychological intervention, such as acceptance commitment therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction program. These interventions have shown significant clinical imp improvements in physical and mental health among a broad range of clinical population, including chronic pain. And benefit of mindfulness have been also found in brain waves. To orient you um, to this uh, um, picture uh, briefly, so beta brain wave is your no more thinking state. It reflects the active thought process and you experience from day to day. And here to right now, probably my beta brain activity is uh, um, uh, active right now. And then um, while beta present uh, represents uh, arousal, the next one is alpha. Alpha brain represents relaxation. When your brain produces alpha frequency, you experience more pleasant, comfortable, relaxed, yet wakeful state of awareness that is stress-free and more euphoric. And the third one is called theta. Theta, theta is even more, even slower than alpha and present in dreaming sleep and theta provides the experience of deep meditation. Like alpha, theta is characterized by a blissful state of well-being. The last one is delta brain waves. It, um, delta brain waves are the slowest of human brain waves, which are associated with deep state of sleep. So research suggests that the increased beta brain wave activity and decrease alpha and theta brain activity um, are associated with acute and chronic pain. Although relatively limited research are available at this point, several studies suggest that mindfulness practice, mindfulness practice is associated with increased alpha and theta brain activities. This, this was found in both long-term mindfulness practitioner and novice um, practitioners. So benefit of mindfulness practice in pain management has also been supported by brain imaging studies. So this particular study recruited participants who did not have a previous meditation experience and completed 20 minutes mindfulness meditation session for three to four days. So they examined brain activity during pain and meditation practice. So I'd like to bring, uh, bring your attention to this picture. So the first column shows how pain activates certain parts of brain areas. The middle column shows how meditation activates certain um, parts of a brain. 
regions. So interesting part is the third column. It shows how these area, the third column shows how these brain area overlaps between meditation and pain. And these following, um, these following, um, these findings suggest that mindfulness is associated with deactivation in the brain area where pain is experienced. In other words, mindfulness can serve as a possible tool to modulate pain experience. And consistently, they found participants reported 40% lower pain, 50% lower pain, uh, pain related distress after these brief mindfulness meditation training. So now you may be wondering, how can we increase mindfulness? So I'll talk about that next. So mindfulness can be considered as a skill, which means we can learn and practice to be skillful because mindfulness is mental training you can think of it like exercise for your brain. Just like a physical exercise can change your body, mindfulness can change your brain. The more you practice mindfulness, the more um, you can strengthen your net neural network to deactivate pain default network. So now let's talk about what types of exercise we can do to increase mindfulness. So there are a formal way to practice mindfulness by setting a time to practice. It can be any length that you choose, but usually five minutes to like 30 minutes, even longer. The most common formal practice is sitting meditation. By focusing on your breath as you naturally breathe in and out, and noticing your thoughts, emotions, and sensation with very curious, open, compassionate, non-judgmental awareness. In addition to sitting meditation, sensory guided meditation and body scans are frequently used in pain management. And sensory guided meditation, including paying attention very intentionally to what you're hearing, touching, smelling, tasting, and seeing in a very open and non-judgmental and expensive way. And for body scan is also been used uh, in pain management. Um, you can slowly and intentionally scan your body with your mind, focusing from the top of your head to the tip of your toes and radiating out from your heart space. So there are other former meditation um, that I listed here, including noticing pleasant, unpleasant experience in, in you probably heard, maybe some of you heard walking meditation, eating meditation and yoga. So at this point, you might be wondering what if we do not have time or space to practice mindfulness in this kind of formal ways. You don't have to worry about that. There are other ways that we can do. So there are, as I mentioned, there are other ways. So we call informal ways to practice mindfulness um, just by pra uh, paying our full attention on whatever we do in our daily lives. For example, when you are in shower, um, you can feel the sensation and warmth of the water. Listen to the sound of a spray of the water around you and your body. And notice your thoughts and feelings as you take in the entire experience of the shower. That's mindfulness practice. And for those of you who have children and grandchildren um, or partners, um, when you are with them, perhaps you pay attention to what they are doing or saying, um, bring your full attention to be with them. Research shows that mindfulness can strengthen 
our parenting skills and impact our children in positive way, it can strengthen the relationship. And these are just a few other examples that I listed here you can do. Um, you can engage in, in mindfulness exercise while you are in nature, walking in the nature, um, while you're listening to music, driving to work, or brushing your teeth, um, doing dishes, um, so many different ways. Um, you can um, dance or um, sing a song, and then you can just uh, participate in that activity wholeheartedly. That can be a mindfulness practice. So another practice can be um, another practice of mindfulness can be self com self compassion. So you can notice when you are being harsh or judgmental with yourself and guide your thoughts towards self compassion. Self compassion can be practiced. Journey with chronic pain is very very challenging. So it is so important to remember to be kind to ourselves during this journey. It is very important. And research suggests that the more we practice mindfulness, self-compassion and compassion, compassion towards others tend to increase. This is because by paying attention to the present moment on purpose, we tend to increase ability to detach from our judgment of good or bad, right or wrong, and that can increase the ability to sit with whatever it arises within us, whatever it, whether that is pain or um, thoughts or emotion um, without reacting. So when we, when you practice mindfulness in a formal way, you can follow this instruction. I thought um, perhaps we can take a few minutes to practice mindfulness. If you're all willing to participate with me, um, we can practice um, just to sit comfortably in our chair, wherever you are. Um, sit down in your chair or uh, lay down if you're uh, watching this lecture in the bed, just to be comfortable, just adapt, relax and alert um, posture and notice um, how you're sitting or um, laying down or stand. Um, some of you might be stand. Then ask yourself, um, what am I experiencing right now? What thoughts are around? What feelings are around? And what body sensation are we feeling? Allow yourself to just acknowledge, observe, and notice these experiencing without trying to change them or answer the thoughts back. You can just simply sit with that, whatever arrives. Now bringing your focus of awareness to your breath, focusing on the sensations of your breath as it moves back and forth in your belly, just notice it. Finding your awareness to the back and forth movements of the sensation in your belly from the moment to moment. Maybe some thoughts arise Perhaps we can let go of those thoughts. Maybe you can say yourself, relax or let go on each exhale. Now expanding your awareness to sensing your whole body breathing. 
being aware of sensation throughout your body. If there are any strong feelings around, maybe you can say your say to yourself, whatever it is, it is okay. Just let me feel it. Allowing yourself to breathe with these feelings. And if your mind wanders to bother some thoughts, just acknowledge and let go of this. You can just focus back on sensing your breath. And when you're ready, you can bring your attention back to the room. I hope um, you all have a little taste of mindfulness practice. Um, you can practice um, after this uh, presentation um, using different types of um, apps or um, app or like uh, YouTube, there are like guided meditation. You can try that. There are different resources. I can also share that with you. Um, so let me continue with today's lecture. So since we did, um, let's recap what we just talked about today so far. So the purpose of a mindfulness is not to suppress or avoid unpleasantness. If we suppress or avoid unpleasantness, our mind will still be full. So it's like mindful or mindful, right? So mindfulness is all about being, not doing. And by focusing it, mindfulness can calm our mind by letting go and being here and now. What we also talked about is mindfulness has been found to be effective for pain management. We talked about scientific evidence to support that. Think of mindfulness as another tool in your toolbox. Different tools working together to enhance pain management. And remember that mindfulness is a skill that we can strengthen as we practice. Just like a physical exercise can change our body, mindfulness can change your brain to deactivate the pain default network. We also talk about different types of mindfulness practice. We can formally practice mindfulness to enhance pain management by setting a certain times of the day and by sitting or walking in different types of um, former mindfulness practice. But we can also informally practice mindfulness in our daily lives, just paying attention to what we are doing fully. And I like to share another quote here. Um, Hope is being able to see that there is a light despite all the darkness. Mindfulness can provide hope because it can create a space for us to respond to pain instead of reacting. We talked about the space that mindfulness can create between pain and reaction. So we can, instead of reacting, we can respond. We have a choice. By being mindful, we can be less attached to distress, distress um, that maybe come with the pain and move towards healing our mind and body so that we can live your, our lives to the fullest despite pain and distress. 
Before um, we end the lecture today, I'd like to recommend the book, this book for you to kind of learn more about how we can utilize mindfulness to improve our mind and body when we face stress, pain, and illness. This book describes particularly nicely about our choice between catastrophic living versus a mindful living when we experience pain. I hope you find this book to be helpful um, for your living. Um, there are also many apps you can download to practice mindfulness and some are specific for pain and I uh, jot down some of them for you. Um, so you can kind of uh, take a screenshot of this and save it for um, later to kind of look more uh, look for more information and in addition to that like youtube has tons of free guided meditation or other information available that you can try and uh, here are additional resources for uh, pain management um, again um, at stanford pain um, clinic, we do offer um, different types of uh, programs, um, virtual pain psychology classes and individual um, and group uh, therapy as well. So check them out. Um, you can take a photo of this screen and um, let us know if you have any question about that. Um, with that, um, thank you so much for paying attention during this uh, presentation. I hope this provides you some information about mindfulness and how you can utilize it for um, better pain management.